We have a lot of tools in medicine to be able to predict chronic disease before things get worse so that we can intervene early. But what about aging itself? Today, I'm very honored to be joined by Dr. Varun Dwarka, who will take us through the science of how the changes that our bodies apply on top of its own genetic code called epigenomics can tell us not only about how much we have aged, but also the speed or rate at which we in various parts of the body are aging. Dr. Dwarka is head of bioinformatics at True Diagnostic. He's published numerous publications in this field in prestigious journals. He's also served as a foresight fellow in biotechnology and health expansion and comes with a unique perspective in tissue regeneration. I learned a ton in this conversation, and I think you'll really enjoy it. And with that, here's our conversation on epigenetics and biological age. Varun, thanks so much for joining me. Really appreciate having you here. Oh, thank you, Nick. Really, it's a, it's a pleasure to be on here. Before we jump into talking about the, the in-depth AI and biology of what you're doing. I'd like, maybe if you could just give like a 10,000 foot view of what do we mean by biological age? How is it different than chronological age? And more along the lines of like, if we know biological age, what kind of stuff can we do with that in terms of planning interventions or exploring treatments or, or new avenues for therapeutics? Absolutely. Yeah. And I, and I think that's a really good place to start because that's really where um, True Diagnostic started as a company was to really understand this whole idea of biological aging and how we can apply it to the average consumer or the, uh, the average consumer who is really interested in their well-being. The concept of biological aging is essentially the understanding the age associated with the different types of cells and organ systems that compose you in the physiological and biological realm. So everyone is really familiar with chronological age because that's the that's the age that is based on the date of birth, the time that the date that you are born, essentially. But there's a separate type of age that's also associated is your cellular. It's more associated with your cellular health. This biological age can actually be altered based on how you treat your body, essentially. So meaning nutrition, exposures to different um, pollutions, pollutant toxicants, um, even things like sleep can affect your biological age. And so that whole concept of biological age really boils down to when you see two people of the same age, but one looks physically looks older than the other. That can be attributed to potentially having a cellular age that is higher in that individual that looks biologically older or perceived to be biological older compared to an individual that may look amazing. I, I think Jennifer Aniston is one of those examples where people are always like, she never ages. She looks the same as she did for 10 years. It might be because her biological age is just better than her chronological age. And so it's, it's that concept from a high level view. And now if down into it, it's, that's where you start to kind of go into how this can be turned into something that a metric essentially that you could use to gauge a person's health. And what do we mean by rate of aging when we're talking in the, in the sense of biological age? Uh, so there, there are various different ways that people have posited in the past to be able to estimate biological age, yeah. something going way back you know, 30 years ago, um, what do we mean by like rate of aging? Rate of aging is essentially how fast are you aging at that point? And so from a, maybe a cellular um, metric, it could be the number of cell cycles an individual is going through. Um, and by understanding the rate of aging, I think that that is a common misconception of what aging is all about. Everyone says we want to res re um, essentially reverse our biological age, I don't think that's what we're doing. Aging is kind of a continuous forward motion. I think the biggest thing that we want to do is actually decrease the rate at which that aging process is occurring. And so when we talk about rate of aging, it's essentially attributed to how fast are the physiological effects uh, of the aging process? How is that being slowed down or increased? Um, based on different types of attributes. And I think cellular replication is probably the easiest way that I can maybe uh, think about it. But there are other methods that uh, absolutely, for sure. Can you take us through 
first of all, the basic science of what is the epigenome. In light of the fact that there have been various different attempts to measure biological age in the past, uh, right. using more traditional clinical biomarkers, or maybe using some kind of metric of like body composition, you'll step on a scale and it's electrical impedance that's trying to infer your age somehow. But what is the more basic science that you're working with? Like what part of the cell or body are, are you working with and what's the normal trajectory through aging? Sure. And I, and I really appreciate that call out because yes, biological aging is not a very novel thing for now. Like it's not a very new thing. Um, biological aging can be quantified in multi different facets. Um, if, if I may, I might go into something called the central dogma of molecular biology. And I think even just like the, uh, relationships that molecular has with the physical. And the reason why we're going, I'm, I'm going into this is I think it addresses that question because in order to understand epigenetics, you have to understand that every physiological output has some relevance to the DNA and all of these molecular output, uh, the molecular biology that's there. So if what the epigenome or the epigenetic uh, markers that are there, everyone knows that your DNA is essentially the blueprint of all your cell of many of your cellular processes. And then from DNA within the DNA, you have um, areas called genes essentially. And the inc the reading of those genes, the expression or repression actually un under is this process called transcription. And then that creates these mRNA and then the mRNA essentially goes into creating proteins, which everyone considers the building blocks, like the actual um, workhorses to elicit some type of physiological output through many different steps. The epigenome is this idea that it is essentially, these are markers where you're controlling the rate of transcription or the reading of the genes without changing the DNA itself. So people might know about CRISPR-Cas9 or the CRISPR technology, gene editing technology. While that is really cool and sci-fi, I think I have to underline it's the fiction of it all. Because if you're altering the DNA, you might have consequences that are unintended. So the body being the beautiful machine it is, or the cell being the beautiful machine it is, has figured out rather than just actually removing areas or imparting areas, you can actually control literally the um, the accessibility to the DNA itself. And so with the epigenome, it's essentially a, a biochemical mark that is allowing the DNA to be expressed or you know, to be accessed or uh, inhibited or repressed in terms of the genetic output. So without changing the DNA, you can actually get a milieu or essentially different um, outputs of, of that genetic output, the genetic process. So we're born with our genes, right? And they're static throughout all of life. If you go buy something like you go and purchase 23 and me and you send in your saliva sample, they're going to give you, these are your genes. They're what everybody's stuck with for better or for worse. Yeah. And what you're saying is that these are phenomena that happen on top of genes. Is that correct? All yeah, right. And, and, and what's, and so what, what is the, the body's, um, what is the physiologic purpose of, of ha having epigenetic regulation of genes? Yeah, I think it's a way to not have any kind of change be, be um, essentially consistent or permanent. It's a malleable way of regulating what gets read, what gets um, you know repressed. And it's almost like a, it, it's a response to the environmental cues. It's easier to change your epigenome even from a chemical structure base because of the, the bonds that are there between the actual biochemical mark and you know whatever aspect. Um, and I, I'll say why I say whatever aspect in a bit. Um, it's just an easier way to respond to uh, environmental stimulus. And I think that the body has figured out that this is the best kind of marker to alter gene expression rather than literally breaking down the DNA and having un uh, unintended consequences. Because evolutionarily, that's not a very fit if we're thinking about Darwinism. It's not an evolutionary, uh, evolutionarily good uh, process to you know, cut your DNA. Rather, I think it's a, it's a response to regulating that. One of the things I do want to point out, and I think this is very important, is that epigenetics is a wide spect uh, spectrum. You have things that actually interact with the DNA, so DNA methylation, which is what uh, True Diagnostic really uses to develop these clocks or these epigenetic biomarkers. 
But you also have things that um, you have biochemical marks that attach to the proteins that condense the DNA. And so these are called um, essentially chromatin and uh, um, uh, chromatin, where essentially you have the protein um, that actually spool, like uh, the DNA is able to spool around the protein and then it essentially tightens it up or relaxes it. You also have other aspects called non-coding RNAs, but particularly the one that I'll be kind of referring to the most whenever I say epigenetics is going to be DNA methylation. Yep. So these are, so, so DNA methylation, these are single carbon groups that are attached to a cytosine. Is that correct? Yeah. And it's primarily yeah. cytosines as of we know now, we might find yeah, out. Know now. Are, okay. Yeah. And then you have acetylation so that the DNA can coil up or unravel so it can be accessible. Right. And then you yep. mentioned MRI, uh, mRNA, just to lay, to give the lay of the land of, of what epigenetics is at yeah. this, mostly at this current moment. Right. Especially. So, okay. So, so then, so with reproduction aside, because I know there's some tricky stuff that happens there from age z zero, you're born it, until age, say a hundred, what is the normal trajectory of the epigenome in terms, especially in terms of methylation? Yeah. So DNA methylation, especially is one, one thing that's really interesting because what is, what is thought or what is commonly accepted is that you're actually accumulating DNA methylation. And I'm going to say commonly because that's what Typically, I think from a grand level is what's happening is that you're accumulating DNA methylation um, during conception and all of that. That's really f funky, as you're kind of alluding to, like you have rapid demethylation and all that. But as you, once you are um, born and you're existing in the world, you are accruing DNA methylation. But what is very interesting and why the whole concept of DNA methylation clocks uh, or these epigenetic clocks really comes into play is the fact that it's not necessarily a general accrual. There are specific locations that actually can be methylated at a greater amount, at a greater rate, or demethylated, because even the demethylation might um, activate uh, aging-based phenomenons, uh, aging-based genes. And so it's not just that you ha that as you age, you're accruing DNA methylation or you're accruing this methylation. It's a orchestra, essentially, of demethylating this right areas and then increasing the methylation at other areas as well. And where those, where methylation increases, is that mostly the CPG islands, those, those clusters of, of uh, cytosine and guanines? Yeah. So in, especially in vertebrates and uh, especially in humans, <coughs> excuse me, um, what they're essentially looking at are um, where majority of the methylation occurs is in these areas called CPGs. Um, it doesn't necessarily only have to be a CPG island, even though predominantly it is, but there are CPGs. They're essentially cytosines um, followed by guanines. And a CPG island is essentially a CGCG. And Cs and Gs are just bases. Now, before we jump ahead into aging clocks, which I'm excited to get into, I wonder, do you have any, I'm just out of curiosity, do you have any sense of, like, do we really know why CPG islands, for example, become hypermethylated or like why these phenomenon are occurring in the way that they do like is it pathologic or is it adaptive maybe maybe it protects against something while we're aging yeah. no this is a great question um right now off the top of my head i cannot um say it in like the grandest detail uh, i do know that um especially in vertebrates a lot of the methylation exists in the cpg uh basis actually if you think of, uh, if you read through some of the papers, and I have to give a shout out to Adrian Bird, who um, uh, Dr. Bird, uh, I think from the Wellcome Institute, has been the biggest, um, it was the person that really fueled a lot of this understanding of the CPG-based methylation. But in vertebrates, 98% of the methylation exists in these CPG sites, whereas there's also mm -hmm. CHG, which is cytosine followed by some other base and then guanine, or lone cytosines those actually account for less than 2% of all uh, methylated cytosines. And so I think, and this is where I would really implore the listeners to maybe go and read a little bit more. I think it is an evolutionary constraint. It's an evolutionary, um, it's an evolutionary basis of, of being able to regulate in specific areas. And so I think that during, throughout um, the natural life, um, I think that the genetic composition ended up that way for, uh, for vertebrates, because especially in plants, they are mosaically methylated, meaning that there's actually not clusters of methylation in specific areas. 
but rather it's interspersed. And so when you look at any kind of plant-based genomics, uh, you'll notice that it's not it's it's not densely clustered. It's methylation is everywhere and seemingly does not have any sort of pattern, which makes it very hard for yeah. AI pattern recognition. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. For sure. When you rely on a pattern that's that's hard to deal with for sure. Yeah. So um that's interesting. So so maybe we don't have the firmest grasp just as a scientific community on why the epigenome shape kind of changes shape in the way that it does, but we know it correlates extremely tightly with aging, right? And yeah. I don't know, like, it, how about like animals that live super long? Like, uh, what's an example? Like, a, like um, uh, I would think the the blue whale. Um, I think um, yeah. even um, um, naked mole rats tend to have um, yeah. some level of longevity there. Um, I so what I will say is. Um, so, for example, I, I, before I kind of went into the aging space, I was studying regeneration and using the salamanders, specifically axolotls. And one of my projects, or one, a significant cha uh, chapter or basis of my thesis, was uncovering the um, epigenome of the salamander during uh, regeneration. And what's interesting about the salamanders is that it's 32 gigabases, 10 times the size of the human. And the wow. idea was that you know, are the, first of all, is the methylation or the DNA um, methylation consistent with other vertebrates? Or one of the things that you'll notice is that in other animals that tend to live a little bit longer or have, uh, there's some correlation with the level of repetitiveness that's available in their um, in their genome. So the naked mole rat, we actually worked with um, um, Wheel Cornell uh, doctor, especially with Dr. Um, Michael Corley, where we developed an epigenetic clock looking just specifically at these repetitive elements, these line one elements and ERF, ERF elements, and looking at CPGs to, um, to build that clock. And the reason why I bring that up is, so we looked at the, um, the axolotl to see if there was any kind of, it's, it's similar. The methylation pattern is similar to vertebrates, but there's actually a lot of methylation for those, um, for those repetitive elements in order as a way to keep them, um, to keep them pretty much, um, inactive essentially. So the reason why I'm saying this is because while there's a lot to learn, we're kind of uncovering pieces and this is where genomics and, uh, and next gen sequencing has been really helpful. Um, and so, yeah, as we're trying to better understand, even in the concept of longevity, I think we ha we're having the tools to really uncover this in the next, uh, you know, decade or so too. That's fascinating. I think it's a good segue too into aging clocks. So I'm thinking maybe what we could do is cover aging clocks. And, you know, I think that's the first thing that people think about when they think about epigenetics. There's a lot more that we can do with epigenetics than, than aging, right? So maybe we can delve into those and, and then kind of take it from there. So sure. can you tell us about aging clocks and what they are and maybe the different generations that have come about um, from the scientific community and, and, and kind of what the latest and greatest is. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to call back that the, the idea of biological aging can be captured by various outputs. And so when we think about, uh, aging clocks at true diagnostic, we're really focusing on epigenetic clocks. It's this idea that you can find a, let's say a predictive number, uh, a number of some type of, um, output and see if that is predictive of, let's say a perceived aging rate. And so what in the context of epigenetics is that due to next generation sequencing and all of these different um, essentially sequencing platforms, what you can actually do is quantify the um, not only the amount of methylation that is available in your body, but really the locations of those um, methylation groups. The body is about 28 million to 29 million CPGs. And so with our current standards, uh, especially when we use this thing called the epigenetic array or the Illumina epigenetic uh, methylation array, you can actually assess 850,000 CPG sites out of the 28 million, which is still, you know, a fraction, but it's an important fraction, and then start to estimate those values and then correlate that or associate that with aging, some type of output. I have to tip my hat to um, Steve Horvath, who the Horvath clock is one of those, it was one of the most pivotal ideas that you could use epigenetics to do this. 
what they essentially identified, and I think this goes into the generations a little bit, is that in their tw- in their 2011 paper, this is before the actual huge paper, they identified that aging, chronological age, is actually explainable by about about 80% or so by anywhere from five to six CPGs. If you knew the methylation of those five to six CPGs, you can figure out 80% of aging, just that you can predict it. And then in his 2013 paper, he realized that this is, whoa, this is crazy. And that's when he built the Horvath clock in 2013, where he used uh, CPG um, data, uh, array data, this next gen sequencing data, and across, I think it was about three to 4,000 individuals built a clock that was able to estimate, uh, the, the, it was able to predict that chronological age within three to four years of error from that, uh, predict, that actual age. So this was a huge leap because I think it goes into this idea that something that is a phenotypic output, this, uh, this concept of age, can also be captured even as mole- molecularly too. Because before that, you knew that there were correlations between, let's say, HDLs or LDLs and, and FEV, um, all of these different physiological outputs that can correlate with age. Now you're saying that actually molecularly, it's so deep that even from a molecular perspective, you can predict that from three to four years of age. And so that really gave rise to this first generation clock and the famous clock that everyone talks about, uh, Horvath. And the Horvath clock, that, that was the way that that was designed was that linked to chronological age? Is that was that the the target? Like, exactly. like, what was the mechanism to create that clock? Was there a certain statistical technique that was was used? Yeah, what they essentially what, what uh, Steve Horvat did was he essentially looked at the correlation or essentially a lasso regression model. So it's a linear regression, but then accounting for any type of error, you're able to essentially add a penalty factor, essentially. And using a elastic net where you accumulate or you account for any type of error and really pull out explainable um, features. I'm going to use that word features a lot. Yeah. But you're essentially training it to chronological age and saying, hey, based on these numbers in this column, these ages, tell me which CPG sites tend to always predict with low uh, error. What are those CPG sites? And so this is where it really comes into like the... And, and I, I think since you're an AI guy, like I want to say, like I really don't like how people say linear regression is not ML. It is ML. It's a, well, it's a really good type of ML because especially great. when the relationship is that strong, which is what he um, actually identified in his 2011 paper, he started to notice you can pick out 353 CPGs, which is what's causing or allowing for that three to four year error a very minimal error in terms of years. And so he's using, he used linear regression with that lasso regression yeah. model. So, so it is linear. Is it, right? it was a linear, and that was the That's crazy. crazy. Because yeah. actually, you know, I, I, so many things in biology are, are non-linear, right? Like I remember exactly. looking at brain, brain myelination, uh, gray, gray, gray myelin volume is a great example. Like you would pull up these charts, you'd have patients from like 30 to like 95 years old. And yeah. you just see this massive inflection point at like age 65. So that's yeah. really interesting that epigenetics follows a linear pattern. But what is really interesting is I'm, I'm thinking about it from like the 2013 aspect. So there was a paper that got released recently from Mike Schneider's lab at, uh, at Stanford University where they started to notice that it's from a general perspective, I think the correlation between the, the different CPG sites and overall age is like the, the correlation is like 0.95. It's pretty well correlated. Wow. But... If you start to actually, you know, put them into different segments, I think that they looked at 45 to 60, you start to see like within windows, more nonlinear uh, relationships. So from a general perspective, I think the linear regression works really well, that linear regressor works. But then when you start to go into the weeds, like let's say you want to make a pediatric clock. If you look into that, then you'll start to notice that the accumulation of methylation is not a linear one it's you know it has little bits of like increases and decreases that make it non-linear and so for the audience linear is a straight line and and that's and non-linear being more like a curve shape so um just for for context there yeah. so so that's steve's horvath steve horvath's clock right yeah and then what happened after what's the next generation after that yeah, so the and so I'll say if the first generation is really more training to chronological age 
and identifying that. Um, but the second generation is that, well, if you're, so Steve Horvath, Gregory Hannum, there was a Hannum clock that was there as well. They improved it by incorporating this idea of immune cells because all of this, by the way, all of these clocks are still done based on blood. And the reason why blood was uh, actually originally created, I, I asked Steve this, is that he said that blood actually had the most data. Everyone was giving blood. Getting muscle biopsies or any other biopsies was just so much difficult. It's so much more difficult to get that data for. And so blood was just easier. And that's where like, it really started to get that. Um, and so what Hannum did um, in his clock is that he accounted for uh, the different types of cellular changes. So you know, changes in your immune system can also be associated with age. And so, but he's still training to chronological age. You know, what turns out one thing they don't teach you in med school is, is what age related changes are in, on like, say for example, a CBC with diff, like what, what cell lines go up and down in terms of blood? Yeah. And I, I think that there was a paper, um, uh, which I'm, I'll maybe still have the lens of the, of these, uh, epigenetic clocks is that, um, natural killer cells actually affect these epigenetic clocks a lot, which means really? uh, there's a significant correlation there, which I'm, which I interpreted. Okay. And I think that the overall interpretation from the conclusion was that the natural killer cell is variable, that level of, uh, of natural killer, uh, output, which then is probably affecting the overall epigenetic age as well. So I think that, yeah, these immune, these sub components of the immune cells, um, are very important when you start to consider uh, the epigenetic age and just just age quantification at this realm. So there's the interaction between these natural killer cells and what's going on in the epigenome. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. I don't I don't think that that's common knowledge. It, it was a um, it was it was something that we had to account for because you know when you're starting to create you know when you want a clock to be highly reproducible and highly predictive you have to account for variations in the system and immune cells are notorious for changing um, rapidly. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And so I think, and so then the next generation kind of comes to Morgan Levine. I think the Pheno H clock, which was developed by Morgan Levine. Um, I, incidentally, I think he, she was in Horvat's lab during that time is look, we're trying to make something that was biologically relevant if we're noticing that if we're predicting to chronological age, that's kind of taking, a, it's a catch 22, right? Like it, you're, why are you training to chronological age if you're wanting something that's more biologically relevant? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where they started to look at in the context, creating a phenotypic score based on protein levels, just your blood based protein levels creating a phenotypic score that's, you know, trained onto some type of comorbid, um, some comorbidity score. So like, I think in their case, they trained it to, I think they just developed a, uh, a phenotypic score and then identified CPGs the same way, which CPGs are explanatory for that, um, that phenotypic score. And what they created was the pheno age clock. I will have, I will say this, the generation one clocks, what they started to see is that error that I was telling you about the three to four years they, uh, of error, they tried very hard to squash it as much as possible. But what I guess uh, Steve Horvath and a few other researchers, what they found out is that that deviation from that predictive, like perfect prediction, that deviation actually related to greater incidence or greater association to things like uh, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and actually had some um, biological meaning. And this is where age acceleration comes into play. This concept of if your, if your Horvath age is higher than your actual chronological age, that had a high association to increases in disease risk. And so when pheno age was being generated, they wanted to actually say, no, we don't want to squash that error. We actually want to embellish it. Essentially. Yeah. We want to have that association. And that's what they started to see is that when you train to a lot of these phenotypic outputs, those CPG sites and those values are actually very associated to, um, they started to have more associations to things like, you know, uh, uh mental health, uh, mental health, um, I think the uh, the biggest one that I'm trying to remember, I think it was some other cardiovascular disease and other diseases in general. 
So the power's in the residual. It's the power of the residual. And actually that's how yeah. you're calculating it is you're taking the residual from the linear, uh, the linear uh, model. So, so just to illustrate this uh, kind of graphically, if you can imagine in our mind a graph, right? And there's a, let's say we do this generation of epigenetic age and we know that we are 35 years old, but it turns out that our epigenetic predicted age is in fact 37 and a half years old. That 2.5 difference in age, in predicted age uh, minus actual age, it means that theoretically at least, it, you are advanced in age two and a half years from maybe what other people on average would be. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. and they always attributed that to, you know, just the error of the clock, but that error actually, and that's where the really coolest thing was is that that error related to um, just overall, like how, like your risk of disease. And that's, that was the biggest thing because oh. your, your age doesn't actually, that number doesn't really matter. It's the, it's the, it's the risk that you really care about because age is just a surrogate of estimating how much risk you have for a specific disease. Mm. And so that's where that uh, residual really comes into play. Okay. So, so what is currently there, there's two clocks that we have on the radar, uh, you could say one is a rate of aging, and then what's what's the latest and greatest in terms of measuring your biological age, and and how are the, those two things different? Yeah, yeah. So the rate of aging versus biological age. Um, I also have to give a shout out to Grim Age. That's another thing that the second generation clock, the the the, the, the thing there, and why this is important is that they train to time till death, essentially. So this idea that like. They're using an entire database where they can um, go and identify using EMR data uh, how long a individual lived, and then essentially picking out CPGs that are, is able to um, um, essentially predict that. But so that's the second generation. Now we're going into the third generation, and so this rate of aging or pace of aging clock, you can actually take if you think about it, the residual that we were talking about is a rate of age, right? If you're in a positive, that means that your rate of aging is higher. But the problem is that you're averaging across an entire heterogeneous population of individuals. These are all different individuals that might have different, you know, you try to regress out or you try to account for, you know, differences in individuals like demographics and things like that. But still you're looking at almost like an average across an entire population. So the best way to account for that is actually maybe follow the same population across a, lo a long period of time. And so this is where the pace of aging clock or Dunin and Pace came into play because what they did is actually really remarkable is they followed about 1,072 individuals from Dunin in New Zealand. And from the time of birth, which was, I think, 1972, 73, until 2018, 2019, I guess, they're still going now. And every, every couple of years, they would take 19 different um, health measures. This means gum health, uh, liver, uh, liver health. Like uh, they, they would take FEV, not, not FEV, sorry. Um, they would take other, essentially looking at different vitals, uh, different panel um, of, of uh, measurements, the clinical measurements, essentially. So they're looking at, you know, the, their, their, um, overall kidney health, gum health, um, lung health, all of that. And they did that until pretty much 2015 or so. And using that longitudinal data, they created a rate of aging score based on some type of, I think it was a Gompertz based model, um, which is essentially accounting for the, you know, the rate of age. It's a, it's a model that's able to capture different types of physiological aging. From that, they created a pace of aging score and then realized in order to, to recreate that score, you'd have to take all of these different 19 measurements. That's not very feasible. It's feasible if you are, have access to, um, to let's say a, a clinic clinic. But if you're trying to make this more approachable, this is where, and why, we at True Diagnostic or any other epigenetic testing company, why this really works is that if you can now turn that into an epigenetic test, again, it's the same idea. Using that pace of aging, put an elastic net regressor and identify CPGs, which are able to 
essentially predict that value. So now you don't have to take all of these, you know, clinical measures. You can just run it through a array. Obviously it's not the cheapest, but it's cheaper than doing a full panel and then re essentially estimate that um, pace of aging score. Now the pace of aging score is because of the way that they modeled it is more representative of your aging at the time of collection, give or take a few months. Whereas anything like, let's say, the Grim Age or Pheno Age is more of a holistic representative, uh, representation because the, the data that they're using is more an average across a huge population. And so they're capturing a little bit more of, like, let's say, historical effects on your, on your age. So this is where I think um, one of the things that we always hear from people that take our test, they're, let's say, um, they're Pheno Age. We don't offer the Pheno Age, but something like a generation one clock or a generation two clock might come back as, oh my God, it's two years older, but their Dunin pace is essentially lower than average. And so they're like, what happened? Why is this? It's because they're capturing two, it's, uh, essentially two aspects of the aging uh, process. Do you, do you find that those individuals have made recent lifestyle changes? Is that, is that what a lot of them are? Do you think that's and, what is happening? Anecdotally, that is what we think is happening is that, um, is that sometimes if an individual maybe, you know, a couple of years ago s decides to make a, a change, the pace of aging is able to capture those effects a little bit better in a, in a more reasonable and understanding way than let's say something like the Horvath clock. That makes sense. Yeah. And while we're on, uh, this topic too, so we talked about rate of aging, we talked about how much you have aged, uh, so more traditional epigenetic clocks. Where does telomere length fit into all this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, t telomere length has always been this, it's been almost like a legacy um, measure of, of aging. Essentially, the telomere length is, um, the, they're essentially nu nucleotides at the end of the chromosome, where I think it's more like, uh, it's just a, a bunch of repetitive uh, DNA that, Essentially, it doesn't really code for anything, but as time goes on and as cells are replicating and, and the cells are being affected by different lytic factors, uh, or sorry, the, the DNA is getting affected by lytic factors, the telomeres start to shorten, essentially. This is, again, a cellular method to retain the integrity of DNA, but as at a certain point, those telomeres go away and then what gets chewed up, essentially, by all by the natural processes of the cell are important DNA DNA that actually codes for genes and this is where uh, disease associated uh, or sorry a, um, age disease diseases that affect your aging rate really come into play because then you have instability genomic instability that causes those diseases and so telomeres have been thought about uh, thought as the re the reason why um, you you're aging you're getting shorter telomeres the I guess the the problem with that concept is that it's not the fact that your telomeres are shortening, it's the rate at which the telomeres are shortening. And it goes back to this idea of, and potentially telomerase. And so there are all these different companies and the, the different products that say, oh, you know, you can, you know, short, that you can reduce the rate of your telomere. But it's also regulated not only by telomerase or this enzyme that is able to lengthen the telomere, it's the activation of the telomerase the gene that controls telomerase but also the inactivation of those lytic factors essentially mm -hmm. and when now when you're looking at regulation of the genes what does that kind of remind you of it's going back to epigenetics and so you could actually use epigenetics the same way that you're training to chronological age uh steve horbat trained dna methylation uh using elastic net regressors to estimate telomere length. Wow. And so now you're That's pretty doing cool. the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. Wow. And so, okay, so so you've got your telomeres. You want them to to stay intact, but as you age, they get shorter. Um, certain factors, and I believe if I, just off the top of my head, I think it's like smoking, maybe radiation, uh, oxidative stress are pretty damaging to telomeres. Oh, yeah. They cause them to shorten up a lot, right? Yeah. Do you see pretty tight correlation with what happens to telomeres and what happens to your epigenome? 
Yeah, actually, um, and uh, very similarly, um, the correlation between uh, the what was it, the methylation and the telomere length was actually a, uh, a I think the correlation was like zero point eight, but negative. So similar wow. to age, but it was negative. And also, another crazy thing too is that the values of those DNA methylation based telomere estimates, so essentially the telomere length as estimated by your DNA methylation, is significantly and tightly correlated, negatively correlated with age. So what it's suggesting is that it, there is, again, a interplay where the, even from a molecular perspective, you're able to, uh, to estimate something that is, well, not physiological, but even genomic. So transcending this whole idea of the central dogma where one layer is, it's almost like a signal chain. One layer leads to another layer, leads to another layer, leads to another layer. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this episode. If you want to support this channel, the very best way to do that is to hit the like and the subscribe buttons. Thanks for listening. We'll get back to the episode. I've always been curious about that causal chain and I haven't found any good scientific resources. Maybe they're out there. Maybe the science is known, but um, regarding the, the causal chain, you know, A causes B, which causes C, or maybe A and B cause C of what is the relationship between let's let's say for example a lifestyle intervention so any kind of anti-aging intervention whether it's just lifestyle diet calorie reduction exercise whether it's a supplement and then what happens to your epigenome and your overall metabolic health right because we know that certain mm -hmm. things like like let's say you go um you change your diet from ultra processed foods a calorie surplus to now you are slightly calorically negative yeah. and you're starting to lose some fat mass, you're putting on muscle mass, your metabolic health is getting better, you're getting less insulin resistant. Right. Like that's gonna have a ton of positive effects in itself. But what I've tried to under, what, what I'm really curious about is, is there a causal chain between those types of things? And I'm sure it's, it's, it's a heterogeneous basket, right? And the epigenome and what happens downstream, or is it more like we're, the epigenome is a, a signal of what's happening on a broader scale. Like it's, it's a biomarker yeah. or it's a sign, right. That we can look for. And to answer. So the, I'm going to say it this way. I don't, uh, we don't know, like, I, or at least I'm just going to say, it, I don't know. And the reason why I, I'm saying I don't know is because I think this is where next gen sequencing and doing multi-omics is very important because again, we're, you know, if we're looking at the signal chain pathway, what we're looking at is one area and then correlating it to another area. What we're understanding is that there's a relationship. But to your point, we're not, we're not sure if it's a causal pathway. It's just a relationship. We don't know if this is like, for example, you know, bringing back my background in, uh, in, in regeneration, what, what they thought, there was a paper, Hayashi et al. 2016, I used to reference um, all the time. What they started to see is during regeneration, the identity of a cell was maintained based on their epigenetic marks. So wow. if we take that idea and put it here, maybe age is a the way that you the cell knows how old it is biologically is through some manner of, let's say, a DNA methylation mark, which I think that that is what's being shown with the tight correlation between DNA methylation and chronological age itself. But if we were now wanting to go into something that's, let's say, looking at the signal to noise ratio or signal impedance transfer or all of that, biological impedance transfer, I don't know if that's a word, but <laughs> let's just, you know, use that. I think that's what multiomics will allow us to understand is how much of the signal is truly being translated over, but also how much is being lost. Mm. And Yeah, that totally makes sense. Yeah. So, so yeah, so multiomics is always been kind of like the holy grail right like because you can know your genes we've kind of almost had that discussion for two decades now right yeah. like since we've been able to you know sequence the genome we've been able to send our dna to like 23 and me um so we we have that level right okay. and then there's like okay well what's the next in, in the by the dogma of biology the central dogma it's okay you get your mrna expression and then downstream protein uh translation but then you don't know how long actually the half-life is of mRNA, right? Yeah. And so, and you also don't know how 
how long the half-life is of a protein. Like, is it going to get degraded immediately? Is it going to hang out for, you know, seven days? So like, yeah, the idea that like maybe the epigenome actually influences a lot of, a lot of the downstream translation, um, is, is pretty fascinating because that means that people would be able to take their, what they know about their genetic risk factors, right? Like, let's say, I'm trying to think of a good example, like maybe you have, um, a certain risk factor for a chronic disease, right? Yeah. Maybe it's, well, maybe it's one of the multiple genes that's associated with type two diabetes, right? Yeah. You could say, okay, I, this is my, these, this is my genetic set that I have to deal with for life. But now let's see what's actually happening to these genes. Are, are they being, um, you know, upregulated or downregulated? So the question that that brings me to actually is, can you tell that all from blood? Because a lot of this is happening in the liver. A lot of it's happening in who, like who knows where, right? Like what, yeah. what can you get from blood? Like, how does that work? Yeah. And I think that this is where I have to tip my hat to, um, uh, Rog of Seagal and Albert Higgins Chen. Um, so from the blood, I think from just like a, maybe a conceptual understanding, the blood is a, is a tissue. It's an organ tissue essentially, which is this highway, the circulatory highway of all of the other organs that are in your body. And so presumably like in a lot of this, the, the blood that we're collecting is cell free. So technically you are capturing, um, the idea here, uh, or the assumption is that you're capturing a lot of the signals because, you know, the cells of your liver, the, the muscle and all of that, they're using the blood to kind of, uh, navigate all of those cell types. And so coming from that, what, um, Raghav and, uh, Albert, um, Higgins Chen, um, from Yale, what they've been able to do is actually estimate different organ systems, the age of different organ systems, but from blood. So now you can actually get something like brain age or liver age or heart age, and you're not actually calculating any biopsies. Obviously there could be, uh, there's definitely that argument. like, you know, if you want the purest of signal, you go to the source. But what they started to realize is that even when you're looking at something that's circulatory like blood, you can capture a lot of the signals from those different uh, tissue types. So to that, I think that paper um, where they introduced it as systems age, which we've actually licensed at True Diagnostic as symphony age. But systems age really addresses, while it's a cool thing to use, I think it's the underlying biology, which is even bigger, is that even using blood, you can capture a lot of those signals to create these type of um, algorithms. So currently, I, I guess I'm presuming, right, that the the DNA that you're looking at the, um, to, to get epigenetic information, that comes from white blood cells, right? Because red blood cells have no nucleus. Yes, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Okay. majority uh, WBCs, yeah. How about like, is there an application of cell-free DNA? Is is it too? Is there too little cell-free DNA floating around in the in the blood to use? Or yeah, so that's I mean that's a that's a good question. I like when they were, and I'm trying to remember the specifics from that paper because I think that the way that they trained it to was again they're using the, they were using blood, but they were also training it to different specific um, uh, tissue types. So unfortunately, I, I would say that we would have, I'd have to look back at the paper, but I do think that the level of whole blood, um, or sorry, white blood cells to cell-free, I, I do think that the cell-free might be over, um, over, they might be overtaken by some of the white blood cells, even though the white blood cells yeah. are still a pretty low population as well. Makes sense. And then maybe like, uh, things can happen to the, the DNA that is cell-free, like that yeah. would interfere with our interpretation of it, right? And, yeah, so. and that's, that's another thing too, is that we're looking at whole blood tissue. So even, you know, disregarding the red blood cells, you're looking at all like a milieu of the different cell types. So if we were to do it based off of a, you know, single cell level, which that's possible, you might enrich the signal as well. But you know, that, that becomes very, very expensive, um, not only computationally, but, uh, from a lab perspective as well. So how, so we talked a lot about every genetic age. I'm really interested in, uh, I mean, that's, th that's probably the most interesting use I can think of. Uh, but the second, at least most interesting, uh, use of epigenetics that I can think of at the moment is actually early prediction of disease, specific diseases. So, yeah. you know, when I work in the ER, I often, 
um, see patients come in with diseases that could have been prevented if something was done like 20 or 30 years ago. Yeah. So if someone had told them at that time, your fasting insulin is elevated or, you know, you have signs of metabolic dysfunction via your blood test or like 10 years earlier, your fasting, you know, your fasting blood sugar is elevated. Like mm -hmm. these are all tiny steps that happen along multiple decades ultimately leading to what can end in a catastrophe for patients. And, and I don't think we do enough to catch those kinds of things ahead of time. Yeah. Are there examples that, uh, that, um, that you know of where we can use um, analysis of what's happening to the epigenome to detect disease early? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that, so you might be familiar with, um, with polygenic risk scores where you're essentially looking at the risk of an individual based on their genetics there are actual there are analogs of that in the methylation world where the DNA methylation world where they're called methylation risk scores. The idea here is that you're essentially similar to um, to all of these aging clocks. You're identifying CPGs that are actually able to predict um, the occur the the occurrence of that gene. Uh, sorry, occurrence of that disease. So whether it's there or not, but also whether it will occur. So using more of like the, the Cox proportional hazard model uh, basis, where that's kind of more associated with time till death and or the incidence of that disease, um, if assuming death is the um, thing you're training to. And what has been done is that we've been able to, not just us, but the general community, the methylation academic community, has been able to show that when you're modeling to the incidence of disease, you are able to achieve uh, prediction values. So, for example, one of the measures that's used a lot in uh, in model building is AUC, the area under the curve, uh, is essentially using methylation. You can get models that have AUCs more than 0 0.8 for schizophrenia, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and we've even shown with depression we can we can get an AUC that is 0 0.85 or higher just simply using DNA methylation as that biomarker. That's surprising to, to hear about depression, right? You think about depression as something that happens in the brain. Right? But that kind of speaks to a larger whole body correlation, right? It, it does. And I think it also speaks to the, the, um, the tissue that we're looking at, right? Like, and also, I mean, it's taught me a little bit about how pervasive the blood can be in capturing all of these different signals. Um, and, and what is interesting too, is that it, you know, we've been able to develop MR, uh, methylation risk scores to specifically depression, but what we're also noticing is that these epigenetic ages, especially duty and pace, that pace of aging score individuals who, and this is where it's kind of interesting is individuals who had prior victimization or PTSD tend to score higher on their duty and pace, their pace of aging, compared to those that don't. But the issue with that is you don't know if that's just a response or a causative factor. And so this is where the population risk scores really come into play because now you're actually looking at uh, predictive, uh, the predictiveness because those not only is those, that AUC present for current, um, let's say depression, but is also there for five-year occurrence whether that individual will get shows bouts of depression in five years later or not. Is depression like the, the top use case right now, or like the, uh, the thing that we are able to predict the best right now? Well, it's so the reason why I brought uh, depression up is it was so actually it's um, cancer is one of them type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease. I will say it's actually very low. Um, I will say for cancer specifically, Grail has done a very good job because they're actually using DNA methylation as one of their um, biomarkers to predict like, oh, like colorectal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's okay. It's not just um, genetics, but they're doing some kind of um, sequencing based um, approach, which they're integrating methylation uh, there as well. Um, I will say probably not as you know in depth, but uh, still incorporating that information. But the, but the reason why I, I keep maybe harping on depression or any of these other um, diseases is because I think depression is one of those things where I think, you, like you were saying, it's not, people don't recognize even from a molecular perspective that can be captured this uh, here. And to your point, if you were able to capture that predictively earlier on, that could mitigate a lot of cost um, associated with 
you know, I mean, just the costs of living later with d- the depressive episodes. Um, and also on top of that right now, depression is very hard to, um, to really characterize until the depressive episode manifests. And so if you can figure out a molecular method, w- which really, I mean, hasn't been shown at, to this level, that, that brings like a whole new second chance to an individual that may undergo that onset of those depressive uh, associated uh, depression associated diseases. What it sounds like is happening with the methylation risk scores is, is that we essentially have the data, the biological data, right? Yeah. Um, that's kind of like, it is what it is, right? But then there's these new soft, basically software tools, right? It, it, essentially different ways of modeling statistically yeah. it, it correlating to a target, right? Is that all just being done with like elastic net regression or some kind of like penalized regression metal, uh, uh, methodology? Or do you see more, is there promise in more sophisticated, like boosted decision trees or like yeah. that kind of stuff? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that ever since it was really shown, uh, the penalized regression modeling methods and the, um, the lasso regression methods have been, are usually the, the first thing we start with. But obviously, as much as I've been harping on this idea that everything is really, oh my God, it's linear and tightly correlated, that's yeah, that's not true <laughs> in a lot so of when cases. you get in when you get into the weeds, it's yeah, exactly, it's yeah, linear. yeah, and, they're, it's, they're, it's, they're, and branched, yeah, it's it's branched. I mean, the, the yeah. nonlinear. Oh my God, yeah, um, I, it's just fascinating that there's a lot that is linear because if you think about it, nothing should be linear. No, but, exactly, it, it is fascinating for sure. But, but then when it comes to the linear aspects, so like, for example, with methylation risk scores, the Cox proportional hazard model is the one that's being used and you can use a penalized method mm-hmm. for that. But there are also, you know, methods that assume that survival curve, but are maybe more deep learning. Right. The thing about using, the thing about using that general, um, lasso regression is that you can take an average and you can predict it, you know even like with an AUC or, or a predictive uh, per, uh, percentage of, let's say, 80%. I'm just making that up. Yep. But in order to get to that 90%, you might actually have to consider the intricate, the same way with age, where in certain facets, there's actually a nonlinear component. And so for that, I think this is where deep learning really comes into play. Um, there's one person on our team uh, who is currently using transformer-based models or and also ML, wow, MLP, awesome. multi-layer per- perceptive or perceptor models uh, for age in particular. But there are actually alternatives to that even for developing methylation risk scores. And I think that before, the biggest thing for a lot of these statisticians who are actually biologists turned statisticians was the explainability aspect. If you use a... a uh, some type of linear regression, you knew which CPGs were being picked out, and then you can interrogate that CPG like from a wet lab perspective. Where in it with AI, it's more of a black box. You have all you don't really know what the connections are to predict that output. Yeah, no, that that totally that, that totally makes sense as to why they would would do it that way too. Yeah. And so for kind of for for maybe people who aren't familiar with machine learning terminology, so so it sounds like. So that the same tech, the te- the technology that made ChatGPT as awesome and powerful as it is, is called a transformal model, right? So yeah. this is basically taking a set of inputs and predicting a set of outputs through many complicated layers. And it sounds like that's something that is maybe on the horizon. But the limitation, right, is that it's kind of hard to, pre- kind of yeah. hard to 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 go back and explain what features or what variable inputs, what in other words, what parts of the epigenome the data inputs caused a prediction to happen. Although I guess you could highlight with like attribution scores and that kind of thing. And but that's, that's, that's more of a more recent kind of approach, right? Because like, for example, if you're doing an XG boost, like a gradient boosting method, you have something like a Shapley uh, importance, you know, measure that says, Hey, yeah. these are the most important, um, you know, features or CPGs or whatever um, based on that entire model system, which provides some explainability, uh, obviously. The and so now I think that's why it's it's almost right to kind of move into there, and I think that's where we're trying to move into there as well is you know being able to now untangle the black box because and and the reason why is not solely just for you know biological understanding is because when you start looking at I mean when you start putting this for a patient 
if they're getting a high score, let's say their age is like, they're chronologically 30, I'll say mine, I'm chronologically 32, my biological age is like 41. <laughs> it's pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. And so the, the question I have is, okay, what's causing that? Why is it that way? If you use an AI black box method, it's very, very difficult to, to say what's really contributing to that uh, versus with like, you know, let's say even with a, um, with an elastic net. And so we, I think, so the, the, what's on the horizon is actually creating individual, let's say, biomarker proxies using epigenetics and doing things like estimating HbA1c, estimating CRP, estimating all of these different proteins and metabolites, and then having them be the inputs into this kind of explanatory um, AI model, if you will. Where now, if let's say, you know, you do something like a gradient boosting method, um, just one type of ML, uh, non-linear ML uh, methodology, if let's say your the most explanatory thing of that of that model is, uh, is CRP, and now my age is being elevated, likely it's because my inflammation is pretty bad because CRP is a protein for inflammation, and so now this provides doctors or um, even like clinicians, doctors, um, a lot more understanding that which is causing you know what might be attributing the most to that value. Now, is that along the lines of Olmec M age, or is that uh, yeah, or is Olmec M age more of a training target? <laughs> no, so Olmec M age was kind of the this this idea was really born um, is is what really kind of led to Olmec M age. And again, and I have to give props. This wasn't a hundred percent like an idea that you know was completely novel. Um, Grim age did the same thing. Grim age to train to time to death. They actually created epigenetic surrogates of PAI one. Uh, all all these different, um, I think, smoking pack years, things that people knew were contributing to aging. But the but the problem that we had with that is um, it, not a bad problem. Is that okay? You're fishing, right? We, we already know this, but what don't we know? And this is where multiomics came into play, where we did every layer. So we got the metabolomics, we got the proteomics, we got the methylomics, we got EMR data, and then generated all of these different biomarker proxies to develop omic mh and that was our goal when we originally did it but then later on when we created all of these ebps we were like oh wow like these ebps by themselves were actually explaining a lot of like what was coming out too like for example they're like an individual um their omic mh might be higher but that crp level was high too and then when they, you start to look at their association to actual protein serum crp their CRP, it's a serum CRP was totally fine. So it's like, it's, why was this higher than this? Interesting. And that kind of led to this idea that maybe it's actually predicting what could happen with that CRP level before it actually right. benefits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So so is this something that is available now? Is is Olmec MH out now and available? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We is, we that, is that the main is that the main test that uh that you're offering at, at True Diagnostic? So we offer, so that that's the one that we developed in house. And so we do offer it, including the EBPs, like all of the sub components and everything. We also offer uh Dunin pace because we licensed it because of how powerful of a instantaneous pace of aging is because Omic MH is actually a generation two. It's a souped up generation two uh, based uh, clock. And so that's showing your historical quote unquote historical age, whereas the pace of aging is offering that more current age so now you're having two different visions of like of of what your aging process is like and then we also do telomere length as well and Hor uh, the uh, a cool. version of the horvat test oh cool or very cool yeah i have to ask you what do you think about this idea of like the anti-aging olympics this has gained a lot of popularity in recent recent times it's all over the podcast uh yeah. various different celebrities doing this kind of thing i just i'm just curious to know your thoughts no i um yeah, so I think that yeah, it's called Rejuvenation Olympics. Um, Is that what it's called? Okay. Yeah, we we actually support it, and um, I'll I'll be maybe uh, more from a personal perspective. I think that what Brian Johnson, um, who's been really spearheading this, um, he used to be the um, the the old CEO of uh, I believe it was Braintree, and then acquired by PayPal, and it's just you know a 
um, like multimillionaire, if not yet yeah, multimillionaire. What I really appreciate about it is the fact that he's bringing the concept of aging as a competitive aspect to the masses. I, I until Brian Johnson has been uh, kind of you know making the waves. I don't know how many tech bros have been like really into this whole concept of aging. Obviously, you know, the, you know, everyone's trying to get to live healthier. You had the whole uh, thing about exercise and all of that, but no one really knew, like people knew about the Mediterranean diet, but no one really made it pop culture or no one knew about like, you know, cold plunges like to this level of depth until really this. And this concept of tracking your age um, I mean, apart from like having an Apple watch, if no one's really went into, let's say using methylation, DNA methylation as another metric for estimating your biological age. And so the, the awareness that he's bringing to, you know, bettering your age is, is, is great. And I think with the friendly competition, one thing that, um, a couple of my colleagues, uh, Hannah Wentz and, uh, Brian Smith have been noticing is that um, you know people are making businesses out of this, which again, whatever you feel about that uh, capitalistic perspective, it's w- whatever. But now people are making businesses on really m- allowing people to live the best version of themselves. So with that, I, I think that that has been the positive out of all of this. You know, one thing, obviously, that I am always wary of um, is the scientific validity. And, yes. you know, this, the, how it relates to the science. And I think that this is where, you know, education is very important. Um, and I don't think it's the fault of Rejuvenation Olympics. I think it's the education around it that needs to still be there. And I think that they're doing a good job of that. I would say if you rewind maybe two years or so, like two, three, four years ago, I was I was a lot more skeptical than I than I am now. And it's in the, the difference between that time and this time now is that I've had time to actually go through the literature and really read about this and see the studies, examine how they're done. Um, even if we're just talking about, there's no cause, let's just assume that there's no causation, which I'm sure there probably is yeah. some, right? If it's all correlation, you know, at the end of the day, at least you have probably a very useful metric of like where you're at biologically, right? So, yeah. cause because the, the alternative to that not having bioobservable data is that you you can't know what's going on in your body and then you end up like someone you know 30 years down the road with chronic disease that could have been managed um, earlier on so yeah so i i'm very enthusiastic about it um i agree with you 100 percent. it's all about education it's all about continuing you know as we make iterations on these types of tools continuing to vet them uh making sure that science is done in a responsible way and and that's why i'm glad that you know, people like yourself are working on this, on yeah, this problem. I, and, it, and it's an organizational thing. This is the reason why we spend so much time and effort and resources to publish papers, because as much as we're developing the product, I mean, we, we did an Enneagram test in our, um, in our, uh, in our company, which is essentially like a personality test. And, um, one thing I learned about myself is I need cold, hard facts, facts to actually understand something. So I'm a five. And so it kind of, I, I, and a lot of people in the company are fives as well, you know, especially on the research and development. And so for us to convince ourselves or it, even for me to convince myself, I, I, you have to do these analysis. You have to do like interventional data. And this is why we spent a lot of time publishing. Like the Omic MH, you can figure out exactly how we created it. There's a preprint online. Right now we're going through the review process and <laughs> nature aging has been, it's the review process can take a long time, but you know, everything is out there. And so, yeah, uh, I think a lot of these are available on like GitHub, right? Where you just go, yeah, you just GitHub, literally get GitHub, file archive, right any of, yeah, yeah. Um, open access. Like we, we make all of our, um, papers open access, um, mainly because we want people to read it, but also to understand, look, if we say something, it's because it's based on something that we've put out and it's been peer reviewed, uh, at least, you know, maybe in the first year or so the it's, it's undergoing that process, but um, like we recently put out a paper looking at the vegan diet, um, the two sets of twins, one set of twins was doing a vegan diet. The other one was doing an omnivore diet. And a lot of people correctly were, were like, you didn't account for caloric restriction. 
It, it's not the fact that we were estimating the diet. We wanted to see if something like diet could affect these epigenetic marks. And what we did was we showed that. So now if people are saying, oh, like, how do you know something like diet is going to change it? Well, we tested it on probably one of the golden type of designs of human twins. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I think for us to convince other people, we have to convince ourselves. And I, and that leads back again to the education aspect. Well, I'm actually really glad that you brought that up. I, I forgot to ask you about that, but yeah, I read that study recently and that was, that was the first thing that came to my mind. I think the vegan group had like 200 less calories per day. Is that right? Somewhere around yeah, there, one yeah. or 200. Yeah. But it was, it, it, yeah, it probably it might've been enough to make a difference right in the, in the outcome, but it's extremely, it's, I, I can't remember exactly the details methodologically. I think I'd have to go back and, but it's kind of difficult to co-vary for, for that kind of thing. It's such an, such a sophisticated, um, analysis. It's just, it's just hard to do that. Um, and, 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 and hard to interpret that, too, right? It, it's hard to interpret absolutely and also they're they're human people right like yeah you, they're not lab mice where you yeah. know you can give them chow that is consistent you know like yeah they you 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 tell them hey try to you know you try to control for all variables but they're still free living individuals yeah and, and i think that's something that people forget about and I, I think it's valid to raise concerns like hey what about the the caloric effect right but i think what people sometimes forget is that um it, it's it's a good it's a good idea to control for covariates like age um you know gender etc when you're like really trying to isolate it the effect of a specific variable right like um if you're trying to compare groups and they have one has a disease one doesn't have a disease you're really honing in on okay what is the effect of this disease on this thing that i'm measuring but when you're doing an intervention study i mean the intervention has downstream effects that are real effects, right? Like, like maybe, maybe it is the case that someone just eats less on a vegan diet. Yeah. It, it, it can happen. Um, I, I actually don't know that literature, but you know, in theory, you could say, you could imagine a scenario where the diet that you eat makes you, you eat, um, have more or less calories. Right. Yeah. And so maybe we're not necessarily saying like, it's the, it's the vegan ism of the diet. Right. It's just yeah. that this intervention did this thing, right? And it might be the easiest way to consume less calories, but feel satiated. I mean, they took a, the, the, the twins did take a survey and they did say that they didn't feel as satiated. But again, these guys are right? coming from, uh, these guys are coming from eight weeks where prior they were eating whatever they wanted. So there's a period of acclimation that you should also expect. But what, it, one of the craziest things about that is that within eight weeks, you saw multiple clocks, Dunedin pace, PC, pheno, uh, sorry, pheno age, grim age, and systems clocks all showing the same exact story where the vegan um, ages or the ages of the vegans went down, significantly got redu reduced at, in eight weeks. And then the omnivores didn't change at all. Mm -hmm. And the only, the things that we did control for were, were age, sex, and, uh, and a few of the technical factors from like the chip that we're estimating everything from, but the, it was remarkable. And, and I asked this question to Chris Gardner, uh, who was another uh, um, corresponding author on it. And he essentially said, we're not going to control humans. <laughs> it's not free will. And a lot of them, like to your point, they felt satiated. They didn't want to eat more legumes uh, for the vegans. So they inherently did end up uh, consuming less calories. And both of these diets were the, the main point of that. that they were both not ultra processed. Is that right? They were both yeah, kind both of, of them were healthy in the diet. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was supposed to, because I mean, to really entice these individuals, these humans, again, humans, um, to stay on the diet, you need to give them some type of, you know, output. And if you look at the paper, we actually, uh, um, looked at, cause I was also curious, you know, if one showed no BMI change and the other did show a BMI change, then you can maybe say that BMI was probably but if you actually looked at BMI, both actual BMI, the clinical BMI, and the DNA methylation estimate of BMI, which we've created, both of them, the vegans and the omnivores, showed significant decreases. So there was a so, weight reduction happening with both, but, but even with that, only the vegans showed that significant decrease in that biological age. Right? So then it makes you wonder, maybe the maybe the genetic processes that were being controlled by those CPG sites that are changing, maybe they were much more 
favorable in the vegans than the other uh, than the other um, diet type, which is possible, right? I think that that's what we did show, or else both of them would have showed decreases, or both would have shown no de no change whatsoever. And actually, that was what, one thing that we did. I, that's that was my hypothesis going in is that in eight weeks we weren't going to see anything. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that there's a possible? Let me just pose this, just as devil's advocate, just for just for just no no please you and me yeah. talking. Okay, so so we know that um, it's phenol age, right? We know that that's kind of like time till midnight, right? Or like, or it's a it's a it's correlated with a phenotype, right? Like, a group age. healthy or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah both. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're you know, kind of like it's correlated with how good someone's doing clinically, right? I, yeah. In general, right? And we know that a, if we just look in general across the spectrum of humans, it seems like less meat intake, less animal product intake, tends to correlate with better health outcomes. So I almost wonder if, do you think it's just like, do you think it's actually a true, like clinically relevant, um, age reduction that the vegan is the vegan uh, subjects experience? Or do you think it's actually just this clock happens to be associated with healthier outcomes and therefore it's associated with less meat intake. And therefore the vegans showed the pattern of methylation that was more consistent with less meat intake. And it, it, honestly, it might be. I think I think the way that you've deduced it, I, it could be a potential next step in understanding the mechanistic uh, relationship. Because right now we found an association or a correlation, which honestly, I didn't think that it would be there in this consistently. And so the next step is then maybe looking at in, internally into these clocks and then figuring out what is the mechanism of action. It could be it might have been so upstream where it was actually the the population that it was trained on that could have uh, contributed to it to to you know like, the reduction like the dietary uh, habits of that population yeah. yeah but i will say this because it, what was really astounding is that the uh, the pheno age and grim age were trained on similar populations but dunedin pace was a completely different du uh, new zealand population mm. And that showed a decrease as well. Systems age included additional cohorts that were not the same exact populations as P, uh, pheno age and grim age. So then the fact that each of these clocks, which are trained differently from different cohorts, are showing the same same um, you know story, is what really th that's what really surprised me. If one clock showed d changes, I'm like, okay, well it's probably whatever signals that's capturing. But it's the fact that they're all trained differently. And capturing different signals from different populations, which really is what made me want to, you know, publish this paper, and I think why BMC Medicine um, looked at it favorably. For sure, yeah, I, that's. I mean, that's such a good point. When you have concordance across multiple multiple um, types of outcomes, like multiple clocks, that does speak a lot to the intervention itself. I mean, you can imagine a scenario where, like, these polyphenols and the different, you know, antioxidants within the food itself actually. Of course they could have a yeah. effect right um, and it, and to which oh sorry to, to which i i really like the fact that you put uh polyphenols because what we ended up doing um with uh another group is that we looked at uh this buckwheat extract which is a polyphenol extract and seeing how that affected the overall output of these epigenetic clocks and we saw no change so it's almost like it's not just one thing that's ruling everything i think it's that interaction of the different diets um, that or the different subcomponents of that diet, which I think is causing a major phenotype as well. And you contrast that to a study where, like, you're having discordance among the epigenetic clocks. Like the, I think you, I think there was one recently. Was it quercetin and and um, and fisetin? Is that is that the right combo? Yeah, it's sadim quercetin. Fis yeah, yeah, yeah. We that's, we that's we right. did a study on that. That was pretty fascinating. Way. That that was pretty fascinating. How there was discordance uh, between pace of aging and the other the clocks. And if I, and if I, I think it was. And it was weird because we, uh, so when we put that out, we were very honest. We, this is kind of, people will see this as a negative result, but I think it goes to show that these clocks are ever changing and we still have more to do with capturing different types of uh, aspects. And that's what we stated in the paper is like, you know, we have great tools, but sometimes the tools need to be improved. And so that was kind of the idea. And, and also on top of that too, it's the population we tested it on. These are healthy individuals. Maybe desatinum and quercetin doesn't really, you know, maybe it doesn't really have that good of a, or a positive effect on healthy individuals. Maybe it really works well with individuals that are undergoing a disease. 
So, um, you know, there's other aspects, but that was kind of the idea that we, um, that we were kind of looking at. I love the spirit of that, that you're, you know, you're constantly innovating and you're improving not only the basic science, right? You're heading towards a more multi-omic, uh, type of approach. And, but you're also, you're also innovating on the statistical methods that you use. And when I say statistical, it's kind of a euphemism for AI and, and <laughs> it is, machine yeah. learning. It's, it's as always, you said, it's as you said, as you said before, the most basic AI, AI model is just a linear regression. It is. So, um. Uh, before before we wrap up, I want to know like what are you excited about? Like what's on the horizon? Yeah, um, it, it changes all the time. Um, but I think from an underlying perspective, it's that under. I think we talked about it um, a while ago, where it's the signal impedance. Like how much of this translates or like passes on here and to here. And with that said, I'm very excited about the integration of DNA me- of these molecular markers and these molecular uh, trackers, if you will, because that's all it's doing. It's tracking um, to, let's say, the, physio- uh, the physical trackers, like, you know, an Apple Watch Whoop is incredible. I love the whole everything that Whoop does in terms of a physical tracking perspective. But my question really comes to- back to how much of the molecular is being represented at the phenotypic level from a physiological level. And I think that's the, you know, billion dollar question that I I think everyone is asking, including academics, because that signal transfer is essentially what drives biology from a single cell organism to a multicellular to a multi-organoid, you know, creature. And I think that it just, you know, going even from like a consumer perspective, if we understand that, I think it'll lead us in a good direction, even from an academic perspective. Well, Vern, you and your team have done an incredible um, job. You're, you're always putting out manuscripts, so I'm, I'm really excited to to find out what's coming um, what's coming next, and to continue to follow your work. And we're um, so yeah, hopefully hats, hats off to you. Yeah, no, no, thank. Again, it's the team at True Diagnostic. They're fantastic. We have a legion of very scientifically minded individuals, all the way from leadership down to you know the the researchers, the assist- the research assistants, the, the, the coders, programmers, everyone. Um, yeah, no, we, yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I think on behalf of True Diagnostic, thank you for those kind of words. Of course. Yeah. Now, where can people find you? If they want to follow your work, um, find you and or True Diagnostic, like where can they, can they follow what you're doing? Sure. Yeah. I, True Diagnostic, you can visit us um, on the website, www.truediagnostic.com. Personally, for me, my name is Varun Dwarka. Um, I am available on LinkedIn at Varun, V-A-R-U-N-B, as in boy, Dwarka, D-W-A-R-A-K-A. I also do a lot of Instagram. I've converted all my personal Instagram into something more because I just want people to know what kind of papers we're you know, putting two years of our life each time into. And my uh, Instagram is Varun, V-A-R-U-N, uh, Dwarka, D-W-A-R-A-K-A. And I try to do my best in making it accessible, even though some aspects of it are very not as accessible to the layman's term, but at least it provides people with some, you know, what's what we're doing at the research development side at True Diagnostic. I, I think that science education is, that's so important. So I'm really glad you're doing that. And thank you again for taking the time to come on and, and educate us about, about how all this is working and where the science is at. Um, yeah, I'm really, I'm, I'm just so glad we were able to have you on and, and chat with you. Yeah, no, thank you, Nick. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, sure thing. Well, thanks, Varun, um, and uh, and we'll catch you next time.